Hello curious cats and welcome to the third episode of the podcast. Firstly, I would like to wish you happy new year and hopefully 2022 will be nicer to all of us. I hope you'll get to accomplish whatever you set your mind to and stay safe and healthy. Good. So, for the third episode, I wanted to start the year with someone I found pretty interesting and special that, you know, his life had a lot of, let's say, positive vibes and left the mark on everybody that crossed his path. The person we'll be discussing today is someone that you might not have heard might have heard of especially if you are from the USA however i have never heard of him before and making an episode on him was fascinating challenging fascinating because he was such a unique character and scientist conducting his research with pure empiricism but also challenging due to his inquisitive methods that don't resemble anything i have been taught or seen. It was a good opportunity of reflection for me and maybe it would be for you too. The person I'm talking about is George Washington Carver, a famous botanist who has murky beginnings. Son of two slaves, he was born in Missouri one year before slavery was abolished. The exact date is uncertain, however. Some sources claim it was either June or January 1856. How are these two months? The only options I could find remains a mystery because I honestly cannot say how they were maybe swapped with each other because they're not even remotely close. I did try to write both names completely wasted and I concluded that not even a blind person could do that. So, yes, I also did the experiment and triplicate. I know what I'm doing. So, regardless, now tragically, George never got to meet either of his parents, as he, his dad wasn't involved from the beginning because he died before George's birth. And his mom got abducted and was never seen again. Mary Carver, his mother, was purchased at 13 year old by Moses Carver to work on his plantation nine years before George was born. The way the story goes is that Mary was kidnapped together with baby George and his older sister by one of the bands of slave raiders that roamed Missouri during the Civil War and were sold in Kentucky. Moses Carver gave the task of retrieving them to one of his neighbors, who was successful in only bringing back George. Now, virtually orphans, George and his brother James, who somehow dodged the whole kidnapping situation, were raised by Moses and his wife, Susan. There was this was highly unusual for a white couple to do, but the pair was against slavery and also yearned to raise kids as they couldn't have some of their own. Because George was so small when he became their son, the pair were the ones that chose his name. You know, while brainstorming, they decided to base the choice on one of the boys' most distinctive characteristics, that being his striking honesty. And so he got the name George Washington, the boy who would never tell a lie. James helped Moses in the fields while George stayed home with Susan because of his frail constitution. But this opened a great door for George. While learning the household tricks, he also was allowed to roam the plantation freely and engage his natural curiosity with the world outside. 
He learned how to prepare different solutions for the house, but also how to take care of the garden or crops. During this time, he started experimenting with different growth conditions for plants, as well as pesticides and fungicides. Through trial and error, he became so good that he was known as the quote-unquote plant doctor and neighbors will sometimes bring him ailing plants to nurse them back to health. He gradually discovered his innate aptitude for the arts, becoming a church singer as well as a talented botanical illustrator. At around 10 years old, he discovered books and started to crave knowledge and formal education. But because his adoptive parents couldn't afford sending him to school, he had to work small jobs for a year while he was attending school in a nearby village. Due to his avid curiosity, he pretty much learned you know, everything that school had to offer within a year. And so he was kind of obligated to hitchhike to Kansas for greener pastures. There he worked as a cook, dishwasher, laundryman and housekeeper while attending high school and got his diploma after seven years. Because of the entrenched racism in the south, he applied to the university in the north which granted him a scholarship. And then he lived happily ever after. Just kidding. The North was just as racist, and when he arrived there <laughs> uh, and they realized he was quote-unquote colored, they denied his attendance. I know, wow. He fortunately got accepted into the Simpson College, from which he transferred to Iowa State College, where he got his bachelor's. So, not everybody was that racist, I guess. After that, he got his master's at the same college. After a few years and a fortuitous encounter with Dr. Booker Washington, another former slave that raised himself to the position of doctor and scientist, he ended up at the Tuskegee University as head of the agricultural department where he remained for the rest of his career. But now the problem was that the lab was more under-equipped as a college student's pantry. So he put together the necessary apparatus from whatever he could find. Hopefully the modern funding, funding bodies won't hear about this possibility, because I'm pretty sure I would be a disaster at making my own beakers. But for Dr. Carver, the land and nature were the best teaching environment. He recognized before anybody that monocrop method used in the south was extremely detrimental to the health of the soil. Crop quality decreased more and more annually, yet farmers were dead set on continuing this practice as the main monocrop was cotton, a very sought after resource. As preaching has never and will probably, yeah, probably never be a cure for stubbornness, Dr. Carver decided to lead by example. He bought the worst plot of land in whole Alabama, and during the years uh, he experimented different ways of crop alternation and soil treatments. Thanks to this remarkable success, he was put into the position to find new uses of the crops he got, as he got way too much after a certain point. I wish that was my complaint in life too. Too much success. Uh, so, one of the most efficient ways he found to regenerate the exhausted soil was to plant peanuts and soybean. This is because these plants are part of the legume family, which are capable of restoring the nitrogen levels in the soil. And now a break for a little botany. I found it really interesting how this process actually occurs. The plants form a C 
symbiotic relationship with a type of bacteria called rhizobacteria, which is capable of converting atmospheric nitrogen to ammonium nitrogen and stores it like that. And that is a big deal as most garden plants need to absorb it in order to thrive. So in return, the plant supplies the bacteria with carbohydrates, which gives them energy to function. The bacteria resides in the plant's roots, where they form little pockets full of ammonium nitrogen. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, class over. So as I mentioned before, this new method yielded a lot of crops, like sweet potatoes and peanuts that weren't really sought after. They weren't really valuable because they were very easy to grow. So consequently, Dr. Carver solved this issue in the lab. And I feel that he went a bit overboard, but I am saying that because he designed 300 derivatives from peanuts, such as milk, flour, ink, dyes, plastics, wood stains, soap, linoleum, medicinal oils and cosmetics and 118 from sweet potatoes including again flour, vinegar, molasses, ink, a synthetic rubber and postage stamp glue. Some of them were found to be you know a bit unoriginal and practical but the mere fact that he advocated for the peanuts great potential was such a great push for its vast popularization and quite literally he changed the landscape for the better single-handedly I have bad news however he did not come up with the peanut butter I know which is mind-blowing I guess you know nobody's perfect but to make up for this devastating oversight on his part. He pretty much, yeah, as I said, single-handedly saved agriculture in the south. So I guess the score is even this time. But jokes aside, he actually did that. The farmers were finally convinced and adopted his methods. In 50 years, the peanut went from zero to hero, and the derivatives invented by Dr. Carver became increasingly popular and liberated the south from its economic dependence on cotton. Also, fun fact, during World War II he managed to replace all dyes imported from Europe and created around 500 shades in total. I mean, go big or go home, that's what I'd say. And on top of that, he recognized the limited lifespan of petroleum and its derivatives, this being one of the reasons why he was so invested in bioengineering. Because of his contribution in this field, he was dubbed the father of chemergy, you know, a weird mashup between chemistry and metallurgy, what's known today as bioengineering. He once said on this subject, I quote, I believe the great creator has put oil and ores on this earth to give us a breathing spell. As we exhaust them, we must fall back on our farms, which is God's true storehouse and can never be exhausted. For we can learn to synthesize materials for every human need from the things that grow. And I do fully agree. He was, in this sense, visionary. And I would really like to emphasize his accomplishments. I know, I, I did that already, but it's even... It's, it's even bigger than I thought. Because... Yeah, I, I need to tell you this. So at first, what I thought I should mention all the honors, medals, and distinctions he got during his life and post-mortem and so on, but then I came across some mind-blowing facts, facts that attest his success and I was thinking there's there's no point in mentioning all that it's, yeah so I'll start with the less 
Is this real or the inter internet is trolling me again? From what I found, it seems to be pretty accurate. It goes like this. In his later career stage, he got an invitation from Thomas Edison to come and work for him for a salary of 100k a year, American dollars, which in today's money would be one million and a half to two million, something like that. I'm not exactly sure on the sum, as I didn't find the actual year that proposal was made, but definitely in the millions. I thought at first that the person who wrote the article on him on uh, Encyclopedia Britannica fell on the keyboard or maybe their cat jumped on it or there's something wrong with the number of zeros, which would explain it, but I mean it's Edison we're talking about, so I guess it's plausible. But, because Dr. Carver has never been money-hungry, he turned down the offer. And yes, that was the less surprising little fact they found. The other one involves a man um, known for his mustache, delusional self-importance, and murderous paranoia. You have one guess. I'll give you five seconds. Yes, it's Stalin. Uh, this dude had the audacity to ask for counsel on agricultural matters from Dr. Carver. To probably nobody's surprise except Stalin's, Carver turned the offering down. I am almost admiring the nerve Stalin had. Almost. What I found intriguing, however, is that because of his methods and genuine way of being, he wasn't really regarded as a true scientist by the community at that time. He was very soft-spoken, with a high-pitched voice, humble and always praising God, yet eccentric in mannerisms and dress, always with a fresh flower on his vest. This helped him get under a lot of white people's skin who mostly showed a sort of adulation, albeit patronizing sometimes, and this popularity with the white folks attracted criticism from the black community as they saw this as a remnant of subservience of a former slave. But from what I read and the resources I found, he generally seemed completely uninterested in the politics and race wars. He actively helped the black community, that is true, but with the same energy he dedicated his life and work to serve humanity at large. I am not sure if it was his nature or maybe the fact that he was brought up by two white people, but it served him from the, for the best. And this takes me to the part that really intrigued me about him. I have never read, heard, or actually met a scientist so deeply spiritual and in such awe for life. Granted, I don't know many people or have many connections in general. You know, my LinkedIn profile being the proof of that, but still. And I say religious because the way he regarded his connection with God was in a very direct manner. He probably went to church, but usually he approached his relationship with divinity in a very personal and direct fa fashion. He genuinely admired the beauty of the sunset and listened carefully what everything around him had to tell him. He had a, a childlike curiosity, which he kept all his life, asking the little peanut what secrets it had to reveal before he started to work in this lab, for example. He listened to the soil and asked how he can cure it. After I read a biography by the title, The Man Who Talks With The Flowers, written by one of his closest friends, Glenn Carr. 
I've noticed this pattern that preceded his discoveries of talking with God while wandering through nature or just sitting in the lab. Now, I'm not the most spiritual person in existence. Shocking, I know. But I couldn't help but think this approach enabled to tap into his genius while remaining humble. Nowadays, logic and reason are served as the only way to pursue authentic and successful scientific research. But what if this leaves the path a bit too dry? You know, I'm not suggesting ignoring reality, but embracing the proverbial, you know, gut feeling. I really do believe that people possess a powerful intuition, especially the ones with increased mental capacity and abilities. But even for normal for folks like us, I still think it's available. Experiencing an unstoppable drive fueled by genuine curiosity and wonder, it's one of the best highs a mind can get. And also the best cure for the soul-crushing mundanity. This life sometimes serves all of us. Now, I'll give you an example of what his method was. And for that, uh, I'll read an excerpt from the aforementioned biography. This was during a conference on clays. I quote, He began by telling how one day he took a walk out in the hills. He he recalled the words, Lift up thine eyes onto the hills from whence cometh thy help. He investigated closer and discovered beautiful permanent dyes and colors in the Alabama hills. First, he showed an exhibit of wood stains in many shades and fine coloring. Then he showed an array of toilet powders from every conceivable shade, from the darkest brunette to the lightest blonde. And then he revealed a rare shade of blue, deep and rich, particularly striking. It is the result, he said, of some chemical gymnastics. This blue pigment has aroused widespread interest among scientists, artists and Egyptologists. It has excited the wonder of scientists because of the extraordinary process by which it has been developed. Artists delight in it because of its reach, and Egyptologists have manifested special interest in it because they believe it represents the rediscovery of a lost process of making permanent colors employed by the ancient Egyptians and marveled by Egyptologists ever since. Such a color was found in a tomb of King Tutankhamen when it was opened a few years ago and it was still just as bright and fresh as if it had been newly applied. The centuries have taken nothing from its beauty. When asked whether this color and other colors discovered by him would remain permanent, he replied, why should they not be permanent? The clays have been lying there in the hills for centuries with color unchanged. There is no reason why they should change now. Which sounds reasonable enough, I think we would all agree. Unquote. So, what is the conclusion of this episode? You know, I guess memorize verses of the Bible and you might also discover something that would make anthropologists envious. But seriously, I think in this case is that everybody needs an outside inspiration source to shine a light on our innate ability to see potential in seemingly mundane things. Call it God, nature, stubbornness to stay alive, it doesn't matter. Curiosity and the pursuit of knowledge are one of the things that give life meaning. And while I know it is increasingly difficult in our modern age when most of us don't have time or are too tired to observe and ask, it is worth cultivating in our tired minds. As corny as it sounds, smell the roses like Dr. Carver did and listen to what they want to tell you. It might not make you a super genius inventor, but it will definitely get you a better understanding of your humanity. And I bet it will make this experience we call life more enjoyable. 
I will finish with two things. One is a quote said by a visitor of Dr. Carver, which I feel that it reflects something most people would like to achieve, and that is being remembered in life and death, our memory and influence lingering on even after we are gone. Dr. Carver said, I quote, One day a man came to see me, and we talked about my work. When he was ready to leave, he said, Dr. Carver, I feel that you will never leave this laboratory. Though your body may depart, your spirit will always be here. And when your assistant takes a test tube and pours acid into it, your hand will be under his hand supporting it. I think that is very beautiful, and I think it may be true. Unquote. I usually don't condone supernatural activity and ghost hunting in the lab, but I mean, if that leads to great discoveries, who am I to judge? Aside my cynicism, this is a noble thing to aspire to, I think. And second and final, I will read out Dr. Carver's favorite poem, and I'll hope it will give you a bit of food for thought. It goes like this. Figure it out for yourself, my lad. You've all that the greatest of men have had. Two arms, two hands, two legs, two eyes. And a brain to use if you would be wise. With this equipment, they all began. So start from the top and say, I can. Look them over, the wise and great. They take their food from a common plate. And similar knives and forks they use, with similar laces tie their shoes. The world considers them brave and smart, but you've all they had when they made their start. You can triumph and come to skill. You can be great if you only will. You're a will equipped for what fight you choose. You have arms and legs and a brain to use. And the man who has risen gray deeds to do began his life with no more than you. You are the handicap you must face. You are the one who must choose your place. You must say where you want to go, how much you will study the truth to know. God has equip equipped you for life, but He lets you decide what you want to be. Courage must come from the soul within. The man must furnish the will to win. So figure it out for yourself, my lad. You were born with all that the great have had. With your equipment, they all began. Get hold of yourself and say, I can. So, with that being said, thank you for listening again. Thank you for everybody that listened to the other two. If you didn't, please check them out. I will be very grateful. I let my email address and also Twitter. Yeah, I made a Twitter account. And check them also out if you have any ideas or you want to give me any other people to talk about or if you think I can better some other stuff, please send me whatever you have to tell me. And as about the um, schedule, I would like to have, if I know you're sitting patiently waiting for any other episodes, I know you're very, very anxious about getting the next one. So I want to put your mind at rest and tell you that I, <laughs> I'll try my best to probably publish once a month as I have a lot of other stuff to do, including my PhD, and it's life is pretty busy, which is good, but I want to be realistic about it. So again, thanks a lot, and next time I'll give you a little teaser. We will be talking about a young lady who, although didn't have the fortune of living too long on this planet, left her mark on the scientific community and her PhD dissertation had great precedent on the 
you know, the developmental biology landscape. So have a good day, night, morning, wherever you're listening from. Maybe share this if you feel like somebody else will be interested. And thank you. See you next time.